Well, we're going to look at several passages this morning. I'm going to begin at 1 Samuel, beginning at verse 50, 55. Again, 1 Samuel 17, beginning at verse 55. So if you flip over to that, you will read the last few verses of, of uh, 1 Samuel 17 and go through the first five verses of chapter 18. Now when Saul, Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this young man? And Abner said, by your life, O king, I do not know. And the king said, you inquire whose son the youth is. So when David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the Philistine's head in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Now, this is now over to uh, chapter 18. Now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul, the soul of, boy, I'm tongue tied this morning. The soul of Jonathan was knit to him and he loved him as himself. And Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, including his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and prospered, and Saul set him over the men of war, and it was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now the next passage we're gonna look at is back in 1 Samuel 8. So flip back to 1 Samuel 8, and we're gonna look at uh, verses 10 through 17. 1 Samuel 8, 10 through 17. So Samuel spoke all the words of the Lord to the people who had asked of him a king. And he said, this will be the procedure of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and place them for himself in his chariots and among his horsemen, and they will run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands of fifties and some to do his plowing and to reap his harvest and to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will also take your daughters for perfumers and cooks and bakers, and he will take the best of your friends and your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. And he will take a tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. He will also take your male servants and your female servants and your best young men and your donkeys and use them for his work. He will take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his servants. Now flip over to Psalm 1. That's Psalm 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. <coughs> Mike. Thank you, Warren, and good morning, everyone. Uh, regarding uh, the copies of Flavel, uh, Mystery of Providence, some of you have, have not had one yet. You've asked for them. I've ordered some more. So uh, hopefully next time I'm here, we'll have those uh, additional copies for anyone that wants one. Um, we have now arrived at the uh, 12th lesson in the rise of David, a king without a kingdom. After the battle with Goliath in uh, 1 Samuel 17, I think this is a good place for us to pause and see the flow so far of our 
story. Since chapter 16, that's where we began, there we observe the setting aside of Saul of Benjamin, the first king, for the new and second king, David of Judah. And all through the Old Testament, this is par for the course because God has been teaching us that He chooses, not like man chooses, not the natural heir, but He chooses according to His own purpose. So it's never the first son. It is always the second. It's not Cain, but Abel. It's not Ishmael, but Isaac. It's not Esau, but it is, in fact, Jacob. It's not the firstborn Zerah of Judah and Tamar, but the second Perez, Genesis chapter 38. And so here, again, not the people's choice, the first king, but in fact, the Lord's king, the second man, David. This, of course, is the theme that Paul picked up in Romans chapter 5 in his argument on justification and redemption. That it wasn't the first man, Adam, but actually the second man, Jesus Christ. So David, 1 Samuel 16, is the object of our study together this morning. And thus far we have been witnessing the setting sun on Saul, He is, in fact, unraveling before us. And the rise of David. In our last three lessons, we were 1 Samuel 17 in the Valley of Elah. Now we begin here at the end of that chapter and move on into 18 with a new leg of our story together. And we observe it opens rather abruptly. When he finished. Now the word when is a reference to time, of setting, of place. And if we're thinking theologically, which we should always be doing, then it is a new providence altogether. David finished talking with Saul, telling us that the word when is a continuation of the preceding chapter, verse 17. 17 of 57, David, the winning warrior, is carrying around now the head of the giant. For some, that would be a pretty ugly and sickening sight. But for some, like the fighting men of Israel, or Abner, uh, verse 55, the army commander, And even Saul himself, down deep right here, where no one can see, uh, every one of those men would be saying, man, I wish I'd done that. I wish I would be the one carrying around that big old ugly head. Ugly to some, but a prize to others. So right here, right off the beat of our lesson, let me ask you, what is it in the Lord's work that you admire, that you're attracted to? And you have that voice inside that says, I could never do that. I could could never do that. Well, if it is attractive to you, Why aren't you praying about it? Why don't you consider it? Give some thought to that with specific direction that the Lord might lead you in that way and give you a similar opportunity. It must have been 10, 12 years ago that Believer's Chapel welcomed back Bill McRae, who was at the time I began to attend meetings at the chapel, the teaching elder in the 70s. And he was their guest and introduced by Dan. And so before his lesson, 
that morning on the church at Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2. He spoke for a few minutes about his life and his current ministry, which he described for the most part as an itinerant ministry. Uh, being gone, he said, every weekend, with the exception of Christmas and Easter. Now, that was a very good message and exposition. But what really caused me to jump was the thought of him being gone on the weekends. I, I had heard all the stories and had come from that world. Man that has nothing, he's built in 20, 30, 40 years of fortune. Look at the Warren Buffets of the world. Look how rich they are, the empires that they have. Had no appeal to me at all. But here, here's Bill McRae taking every weekend of the year away from his home and family. Wow, that guy is really doing something. And so I began to pray and ask God for that opportunity myself. You may think I just stumbled into this class uh, not knowing where I was going. But it actually, it was prayer long before I ever walked in here and the lights were turned on. You see, people look at me and they say, God, don't you just get sick of it? All the traffic in Dallas, that construction on I-35, don't you get tired of it? Well, it's like David carrying around that big old head. For some, it's a prize. For some, it's a very macabre scene. But I consider my opportunity to be with you a prize. It's what I admired about Bill McRae and his zeal. And I now urge you, whatever really appeals to you. And you say, well, I could never do that. Or you may say, Gosh, if I just had that big old lug sword, then I would have gone out there. Or if I had that guy's big old shield, then I would have gone out there. You're, you are lying to yourself. No, David didn't have any of those things, and he went out there. No, friends. Here's your lesson, as now, so then. Look, be open to the ministry that God's Spirit is urging you to do at all times. And be faithful in everything. Here's 1 Samuel 18.1. When a new chapter, a new providence... Look, right off the heel of his brother's rejection, God sends him a friend. A friend from the most unlikely of places. The house of Saul himself. And don't miss the significance of this. Remember, significance is not what happens, but what happens means. God will send into your life people that will give you what you are lacking or what you have lacked before you became a believer. And they may come from the most unlikely of places. New relationships that will be helpful to you, not harmful. Jonathan loved, and not only Jonathan, but also his sister Michael, verses 20 and 21 of our new chapter, and all Israel and Judah, verse 16, along with the king's servants, verse 22. But our immediate attention here is to Jonathan and the power of human friendship. They simply had so much in common with one another. Both were warriors. 1 Samuel 14, we have the story of the bravery and the power of Jonathan as a warrior, fighting the Philistines on his own and being victorious. 
They were both incredibly brave. They shared the same mentality and the same convictions about certain things. Jim Boyce told me the day that he met Eric Alexander, they became instantly close that day. Talked for hours and hours, and in Boris's own words to me, he said, at the end of the day, I said to Eric, isn't it amazing? We're halfway around the world from one another, and yet we have so much in common. All of this is in contrast to King Saul, whose love for David playing the harp is a love of what you can do for me. Now, that's the world, and that's the world system. Throw touchdown passes, the world loves you. Throw the crucial interception, and that love fades fast. It's a love for what you do, not who you are. Look, verse 8, the love fades fast. You have the word anger from Saul. Verse 9, suspicion, fear. Repeated themes in the chapter. Verse 12, verse 15, verse 29. So love and hate are the tug of war back and forth in this new chapter with David. Notice the word attached. King James knit, New American Standard, Committed. This is really a cool word, if I might be so irreverent to say that. Uh, Genesis chapter 44 and verse 30, it's used by Judah explaining to this very powerful man down in Egypt who oversaw the distribution of food. And he was explaining to him how important this, this half brother that's quite a bit younger than he is, is to their mutual father, Jacob. And in Genesis 44, 30, he says to this, this man, his life is bound up. And that's our verb. Bound up, knit, tied together, committed, attached to the boy's life. You ever seen a big ball of rubber bands? I've seen them on people's desks. I don't even know how you start something like that. But imagine that big ball of rubber bands, and then you take it and you dip it into something like a bucket of Gorilla Glue, and you let it harden. I don't care how hard your fingernails are or how long, you're never going to separate that ball and those rubber bands, that's this word. They are attached in a thousand different ways. Now look at this, verse 2. Saul took David. One word, took. It's the right of the king. 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 11. The prophet warned Israel, you want a king? Well, here's what you're going to get. He will take your sons. He will take your daughters. Verse 13, he will take. Verse 14, fields, vineyards. 15, a tenth of your grain. 16, the best of your livestock. Verse 17, flocks. The king is a taker. That's the big idea that Samuel gives to the people. And it pains me. It pains me. 2 Samuel 11.4 Regarding Bathsheba, David sent messengers and took her. See how much better Israel was without a king when their king was invisible? My friends, at Believer's Chapel, we teach the Reformation principle of the priesthood of the believer. 
Um, you are a priest before Him and answer directly to Him by the Word of God and by the power of the Spirit that resonates within you. I sat across from a guy at lunch this past week and he, he's struggling in his business and he tells me, you know, and yet I covenant tithe. I looked at him. You know, I covenant tithe. I said, I've never heard that term before. I've heard them separate, but never together. Well, you know, it's my obligation. <laughs> no. No, here's your New Testament obligation. Give as the Lord prospers. He's not prospering you. You're not under any obligation. What obligation is a man putting you under? Well, my pastor, I need to covenant tie. We had that conversation. He said, you, you've taken a thousand pounds off my shoulders today. My friends, we report to Jesus Christ, our King, under the instruction of the Word of God. We teach the priesthood of the believer. The Christian life is not a bunch of do's and don'ts. You are led by the Spirit. Those who the children of God, said Paul, follow the Spirit. They're led by the Spirit of God. But man, you see, man can't do that. John Calvin says he's always the idol maker. So we have to have a ruler. And we want one that we can see and feel and touch. Give us religious gatherings with hats and cloaks of color. Bright stained glass windows. The smell of incense in the auditorium. And prevalent crosses everywhere. Often draped now. I don't know if you're aware, but now often draped and ornamented by some clever interior designer, approved, of course, by a committee, that would be done tastefully with a wrap, or, and we shine the different lights on it. It appeals to the senses. Oh, give us a king that we can see and hear. Well, today, my friends, our King is invisible. I am never expected to see Him. I hear His voice through His Word to me and for me and by the motivation of the Spirit of God. Here's verse 3. And Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him like himself. Jonathan... Son of the King, a brief life as we know it in the Scriptures is simply a magnificent man. The Jewish Christian Alfred Edersheim wrote, a more unselfish, warm-hearted, genuine, or noble character is not presented to us in all of the Scriptures. Edersheim says, this man, Jonathan, isn't a type of greatness he is greatness. The word made. It's the word in the inspired language to cut. We talk about cutting deals. It's actually from cutting the animal in two to make a covenant. That's the idea from the Old Testament. And Jonathan, this son of the king, is obviously making a covenant and binding it with David. This agreement between the two is devoid of details, but from time to time through the Scriptures, we will pick up some of the content of what they agreed to. Jonathan, the son of the king, is obviously the initiator. He reached out. Are you like that incredible man? Do you reach out to people? 
I don't know what your idea of the Apostle Paul is by personality, but a text that always impressed me was Acts chapter 27 and verse 3. In Acts 27, 3, we're told that Paul was handed over to a Roman centurion by the name of Julius. Now, Roman history tells us that if you're a centurion and you lose your prisoner, you lose your life. And yet, after only four days' journey, four days, with the Apostle Paul, this man Julius let Paul go off the ship all alone. The Scriptures say, 27.3, in kindness to Paul, Julius allowed him to go to his friends so that he might provide for their needs. I flew aboard a Southwest jet once and saw a man handcuffed to another. He had a white hat. He might have been a U.S. Marshal, a Texas Ranger. I don't know. But can you imagine? You land, they open that door of the jet, and the Marshal, the Sheriff, and he unconnects the handcuffs and says, I'm going to go get the squad car. I'll meet you out in front of the airport. (laughs) It tells you the kind and winsome man that Paul is. And that should be a lesson to all of us. He cultivated people with kindness and with warmth and affection. That's the way Paul was. Jonathan reached out. Howard Hendricks would say to us students, gentlemen, lovers or leaders. That would ricochet off my forehead like a rock on a tin shed. And then I got out in life and I realized how true that was. That people that really loved me led me. And that that was very powerful and I followed them. Because I, I saw that they cared. Are you like that oh, to other people? If not, why not? Jonathan could have seen David as a rival. Been wary of him. Jonathan, the eldest son of Saul, was next in line to the king. But Jonathan, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, did nothing from vain ambition or selfish conceit, but rather counted others as better than himself. This final phrase, look, he loved him as himself. Well, that, that's the law. Look at this perfect man. He he is acting in accordance with the law. Loving others like himself. Jonathan took off his robe, gave it to David with the armor and with a sword and belt. Back in chapter 17, verse 38, in Saul's tent, we made a point of saying that Saul giving David his armor was actually an abdication of his title, his place, of his calling. Because the exchange of garments in Israel is an exchange of office. Numbers 20, 25, and 26. 1 Kings 19, Elijah taking off his coat and giving it to the new prophet, Elisha. The exchange of garments is the exchange of of title, of place. Saul trying to pawn David off, get him out there in front of the giant, looking like him, but not being like him. Saul was taller than all the other men. All the other men fighting out there in the valley of Elah. But he gave way to fear and happened for somebody else to take his place. The man who took his place, we now know, has been anointed by God, empowered by God, 
The Spirit of God resided upon him. He was the substitute for Saul, and he accomplished the task. This robe, this armor, this sword, this belt of Jonathan, they're elements of affection. Giving to his new best friend the best of his things. I hope you have a friend like that. I hope you are a friend like that. We conclude our lesson this morning with verse 5, which is a summary statement. In the, if you have a King James, an English Standard Version, or a New American Standard, you have in the, that verse 5 three ands, and that's a nice way to study this verse together. And David went out, and Saul set him or appointed him finally, and it was good in the eyes of. So, the top line, David went out. Went out, that stands for battle, for military campaigns. Saul, the recognized authority, he has the army, he has the flags and the trumpets. The verb to send, it ties nicely into line two, appointed him over. See, he's the guy doling out the orders, doing all the promotions. Notice his name, Saul, is mentioned three times in the text. He's the king, he's number one, which is important to us because we are setting up a contrast right here in the verse. Then our last word in line one, successful. That's what I want. That's what I want for you. To be successful. The word successful is a little different. After you study it out, the profile is actually different than what you think the scriptures are saying. So let's stop for a moment and do a carve out and think uh, this through because this is going to be important in laying the foundation of our story from this time forward with David. See, David is going to be successful all the way through. And we need to get this idea of prosperity riveted to our minds. So let's start it this way. When a man walks closely with the Lord, that man is made powerful. God makes him that way. Now, in my part, and even today, when I see a powerful man or a woman like that, the first thing I want to do is I want to listen to them, and I want to listen carefully. And then I want to imitate them, the things that they do. I want to put in practice for myself. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So who is Paul following? Well, here is the one he's following. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. To survive physically in the body, you have to eat, you have to drink, you have to consume. To survive spiritually, you have to eat and drink and pursue righteousness. So we need to make personal righteousness our goal for daily living one day at a time. Righteousness is my goal. Successes and trials, difficulties, hardships never distract us from our goal. And that is to pursue Him at all times. I focus on the Lord in happiness and in sorrow. I desire Him first. I stay close to the Lord because that's where the power is. Robert Murray McShane, it's not great gift that God blesses, but great likeness to Jesus Christ. Let's take Job, for example. Went through horrible, horrible suffering. Wrestled with God all the way through the book. But he stayed close to the Lord. He kept worshiping Him. 
And he remained throughout the book powerful. How powerful, you say? So powerful that if he didn't pray for his friends, they were going to die. That's power. How about Joseph? Prospering. It's a different word than we have in 18.5, but the English translation is the same, and the concept is basically the same as well. The word means to prosper, to succeed, to advance. He did so because the text says that the Lord was with him. That's 39.2. Now, that word is the same word that we have in Psalm 1, prospering. And it's the prevalent image of the tree in the psalm. The tree is the man, the man is the tree. In the psalm, we have the image of tree roots going down below the surface, tapping into the river. It's the picture of the Word. The Word of God is the river tapping into the tree. Now let's think this through for a minute. You have four seasons of the year in Palestine. That's the author's thinking, looking at that tree. In some of those seasons, there isn't a leaf on that tree. There's no fruit whatsoever on that tree. And so I say to you, is that your tree? Yeah, that's my tree. Well, there's nothing on it. Let's cut it down and burn firewood and get something useful out of it. No, no, I, I, I believe this tree's going to come back. Well, the tree's not going to come back. The tree is going to come back for something that you don't see because it's not on the surface. It's below the surface, and it's tapped into the Word of God. That's the psalm. Looks can be deceptive. Joseph, 39.2, is in the house of Potiphar. Everything he's touching turns to gold. He's prospering. He's advancing. He's highly effective. I've got a little six-inch ruler that I'll have in my Bible at all times to underline things. Six-inch ruler. And you lay 39.2 with a six-inch ruler straight down, and you come to 39.21. And now, where is that Joseph? Well, he's in prison. Same guy. Well, how do you explain that? Well, he, he advanced up the ladder. He, atta he attracted the attention of Potiphar's wife and the man that never got caught up in his successes, but stayed focused on the Lord and stayed close to the Lord. Well, you know the story. Now he's in prison. So prosperity, advancement brings its own set of problems. And it's never what the eye sees. Now think with me about this. I'm following the, the head of the jail. Pharaoh's jail. He's got a torch in front of me. And he's running through his prisoners. I got a murderer here. I got a thief here. And this guy, he's a Bedouin, not an Egyptian. He's in here for some kind of a sex rap. And that's all we see. And yet Joseph all that time was advancing and made powerful. How do I know that? Well, think about this. Joseph interpreted the dream of the cupbearer and the baker when he was standing in the prison. And he interpreted the Pharaoh's dream when he was standing in his pristine palace and throne room in front of everyone. See, he's the same man. It's never a question of your prosperity. It's always the issue of who is standing with you. You see, my friends, the Lord was right there with him in the prison. That's 3921. Think about Paul. He's beaten, he's stoned, he's left for dead, pitched over in a ditch, got rid of him. And yet he, he wakes up, he comes back. You take a mug shot of him and you would say, that guy has been hit by a riot. Oh, 
what a, what a horrible, disfigured man this is. Nose smeared all over his face. Lips all swollen. Who is he? I'll tell you who he is. He's the most important man alive in the world. He's the man that's bringing the knowledge of God to the Gentiles. That's who he is. This word prosper, don't get caught up in it. Here's what we think, and here's what's important. It's not sorrow and sadness. It's not prosperity and advancement. It is proximity to the Lord. Stay close to the Lord in all things. And you see, you look at a text like this, from all outward appearances, it would seem that, call, that Saul is calling all the shots. Go here, go there, do this, do that. But Saul's just a florist shop. You go in there, all the colors are bright, the smells are fabulous, but everything's dead. But you don't know that. So I take flowers home to my wife, and she's all excited, puts them in a vase, and she said, did you bring the little, the little tablets? What tablets? Well, go back and get the tablets. You put the tablets in the water, they go up the stem, keep the flowers vibrant. No, I didn't to get the tablets. Go back and get the tablets. So I go back and get the tablets. But they're dead. They're dead. It's only a matter of time till you see the decay. This man, Saul, is dead. He's unraveling. And the sun is setting on his life. Here's the last and line three. And it was good in the eyes of the people. And even in the eyes of Saul's officials. Notice the repetition of eyes here. It's uh, from the common people to the brass and the military. This was all good. They were all in on that promotion. And isn't this the appropriate time in the lesson to, pro, uh, to quote Proverbs 22.1? How much better is a good name than silver and gold? Because that word good is the same word that's used right here. Good. The advancement of David was for the benefit of everyone in Israel. And that's a blessing. Now, in prosperity and in suffering, in advancement and in difficulty, you stay close to the Lord because that's what God is using to overflow out of your life for the benefit of others. See, you're powerful. God makes you powerful. And your loss, yeah, it's grieving. It's a heartbreak. But it's making you powerful. It's making you the man and the woman that God wants you to be that flows out of your life and on to others that they may be built up. Powerful. That's the idea. And that's what I want for each and every one of you. In the season that God has for you, you will be always powerful. In tragedy, in difficulty, and in prosperity. God using you to advance His kingdom. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. Thank You for the Word of God that educates us, stimulates us to righteousness. Thank You for Believer's Chapel, for the elders here, and the elders that have been with us in the past. Guide, guard, direct, and bless them. Bless their families. Prosper the Word of God to each and every one of us as believer priests to follow Your Word and to do Your will. And we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.